This is Jack Foley, and today's show is a continuation of last week's show. And for those of you who didn't hear last week's show, I'm going to read to you what I said on last week's show. The show deals with a book called Perennial Earth, poetry by Wallace Stevens, and paintings by Alexis Serio, S-E-R-I-O, edited by John N. Serio. I wrote a short piece about the book, beginning with a quotation from Wallace Stevens. The quotation is from Stevens' poem, Poetry is a Destructive Force. The lion sleeps in the sun. Its nose is on its paws. It can kill a man. John N. Serio is a distinguished scholar of Wallace Stevens. His daughter, Alexis Serio, is a highly accomplished painter and teacher. How are these facts connected? Perennial Earth, the book I'm talking about, is not a book of selections from Wallace Stevens' poetry illustrated by Alexis Serio. Though Alexis Serio is deeply aware of Stevens' work, these paintings were done independently of the poems contained in the book. They have their own titles, inhabit their own world. Rather, Perennial Earth is a brilliant act of collage, even of collision, by John N. Serio. The marvelous poems, some complete, some excerpted passages from longer works, have many pleasures. The marvelous paintings have many pleasures. But the great creative act of this book is the discovery of connections between the two. The power of the book is in the editing. The poem of the mind in the act of finding what will suffice, Stevens wrote in Of Modern Poetry. It must be this finding of a satisfaction and maybe of a man skating, a woman dancing, a woman combing. The poem of the act of the mind. Perennial earth is precisely such an act of the mind. How often have we come upon a Stevens poem we have somehow never seen before and thought, how wonderful. Perennial Earth offers us that pleasure, along with the pleasure of noticing the intersection of the visual with the verbal. Wallace Stevens was an enormously complex man and sometimes found relief from his immensely subtle consciousness by being a boor, a belligerent drunk. Ernest Hemingway decked him once and wrote to him, You're a wonderful poet but you don't know how to fight. That, Stevens, is nowhere to be found here. The fundamental impulse of Alexis Serio's stunning paintings is a movement upward. Stevens writes, We say God and the imagination are one. How high that highest candle lights the dark. Out of this same light, out of the central mind, we make a dwelling in the evening air, in which being there together is enough. That's the Wallace Stevens who felt that the force of poetry was leonine strong enough to kill a man. That's the Stevens and the Alexis Serio that we find in this beautiful, highly original book, Perennial Earth. Though I can't show you the paintings on the radio, I can read you the poems included in the book, or at least some of them, and they're all by Wallace Stevens. You can find samples 
of Alexis Serio's art at https colon slash slash alexisserioart.com slash. That's Alexis, A-L-E-X-I-S, and Serio, S-E-R-I-O. The book is also available in both hard and softbound printings at alexisserioart.com. I'm going to begin with a poem titled Esthétique du Mal. It's simply a section from that poem, but it's a famous section, Aesthetic of Evil. It's a play, obviously, on Baudelaire's famous title, Fleur du Mal, Flowers of Evil. If Baudelaire could write Flowers of Evil, Stevens can write an aesthetic of evil. The greatest poverty is not to live in a physical world. To feel that one's desire is too difficult to tell from despair. Perhaps after death, the non-physical people in paradise, itself non-physical, may, by chance, observe the green corn gleaming and experience the minor of what we feel. The adventurer in humanity has not conceived of a race completely physical in a physical world. The green corn gleams and the metaphysicals lie sprawling in majors of the august heat, the rotund emotions, paradise unknown. This is the thesis, scrivened in delight, the reverberating psalm, the right corral. One might have thought of sight, but who could think of what it sees, for all the ill it sees? Speech found the ear, for all the evil sound, but the dark italics it could not propound. And out of what one sees and hears, And out of what one feels, who could have thought to make so many selves, so many sensuous worlds, as if the air, the midday air, was swarming with the metaphysical changes that occur merely in living in and where we live. And out of what one sees and hears, and out of what one feels, who could have thought to make so many selves, so many sensuous worlds, as if the air, the midday air, was swarming with the metaphysical changes that occur merely in living as and where we live. That's Wallace Stevens, the greatest poverty, is not to live in a physical world, which is something he believes, but also does not believe. Stevens' propositions are not necessarily truths, but only momentarily momentary moments or momentary aspects of truth, which he feels intensely. But they are not absolute, no absolutes in Stephen's world. And he moves towards the divine in one way or another, constantly, in a way, contradicting himself. The next poem is one of his most famous. It's called 
13 Ways of Looking at a Blackbird. 1. Among twenty snowy mountains, the only moving thing was the eye of the blackbird. 2. I was of three minds, like a tree in which there are three blackbirds. Three. The blackbird whirled in the autumn winds. It was a small part of the pantomime. Four. A man and a woman are one. A man and a woman and a blackbird are one. Five. I do not know which to prefer, the beauty of inflections or the beauty of innuendos. The blackbird whistling or just after Six. Icicles filled the long window with barbaric glass. The shadow of the blackbird crossed it to and fro. The mood traced in the shadow an indecipherable cause. O thin men of Haddam, why do you imagine golden birds? Do you not see how the blackbird walks around the feet of the women about you? 8. I know noble accents and lucid inescapable rhythms. But I know, too, that the blackbird is involved in what I know. Nine. When the blackbird flew out of sight, it marked the edge of one of many Circles. Ten. At the sight of blackbirds flying in a green light, even the boards of euphony would cry out sharply. Eleven. He rode over Connecticut in a glass coach. Once a fear pierced him, in that he mistook the shadow of his equipage for blackbirds. Twelve. The river is moving. The blackbird must be flying. Thirteen. It was evening all afternoon. It was snowing, and it was going to snow. The blackbird sat in the cedar limb. That's 13 ways of looking at a blackbird. And this next poem is also a famous Stevens poem. I remember in a class I took that um, the teacher decided to introduce us to Stevens with this poem. It has to do with Stevens' somewhat ambivalent 
uh, attitude towards landscape. It's called The Snowman. One must have a mind of winter to regard the frost and the boughs of the pine trees crusted with snow and have been cold a long time to behold the junipers shagged with ice, the spruces rough in the distant glitter of the January sun, and not to think of any misery in the sound of the wind, in the sound of a few leaves, which is the sound of the land, full of the same wind that is blowing in the same bare place. For the listener, who listens in the snow and nothing himself beholds nothing that is not there and the nothing that is. For the listener who listens in the snow and nothing himself beholds nothing that is not there and the nothing that is. There is nothing behind nature. Nature doesn't manifest anything other than itself. Unless, of course, sometimes it does. He is a complicated man. But that position of atheism is one from which he seems to begin. But I think it's an ambivalent feeling that he has, that he begins with ambivalent feelings about the world. The greatest poverty is not to live in a physical world. He wants the world, and yet at the same time, he wants to move beyond it, too. And it's a very complex balancing act that he does. This is the conclusion of a marvelous poem called Sunday Morning. She hears upon that water without sound a voice that cries, The tomb in Palestine is not the porch of spirits lingering. It is the grave of Jesus where he lay. We live in an old chaos of the sun or old dependency of day and night or island solitude, unsponsored, free of that wide water, inescapable. Deer walk upon our mountains and the quail whistle about us their spontaneous cries. Sweet berries ripen in the wilderness, and in the isolation of the sky, at evening, casual flocks of pigeons make ambiguous undulations as they sink downward to darkness on extended wings. Those lines, and especially that phrase, ambiguous undulations, is there nothing behind nature? Is there nothing behind what we see? If there's nothing there, if, there, if we're simply snowmen, you know, nothing inside, if there's nothing behind what we see, how can the undulations that the pigeons make be ambiguous?
the world is constantly announcing itself to us, even as we, in Stephen's world, constantly deny that it is announcing anything. Deer walk upon our mountains, and the quail whistle about us their spontaneous cries. Sweet berries ripen in the wilderness, and in the isolation of the sky, at evening, casual flocks of pigeons make ambiguous undulations as they sink downward to darkness on extended wings. Much of modernist poetry, William Carlos Williams, for example, who was a close friend of Wallace Stevens, and others, God knows uh, that uh, Charles Olson <laughs> hated I am Pickman Demeter, um, even though the last line of his Maximus poems is a line of perfect iambic pentameter. The poem <laughs> ends with iambic pentameter finally defeating the poet. Williams is a master of iambic pentameter. De dum de dum de dum de dum de dum, downward to darkness on extended wings. This whole poem, uh, Sunday morning, is written in iambic pentameter. And of course, it's a masterpiece and a brilliant and new way of treating iambic pentameter. You can't keep a good meter down. But, as I say, so much of modern poetry has been an attack on iambic pentameter, not in Stevens. Uh, at the time that Stevens was writing these poems, um, William Carlos Williams had his admirers, but he was also regarded by uh, many of the literati as, you know, a not bad, pretty good, simple-minded poet. <laughs> this is not. This is, of course, not true about Williams. But that's old Doc, old Doc Williams. You know, he is basically a doctor. He wrote some nice things. You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> um, that was not Wallace Stevens' opinion, and to his credit, and he wrote a poem called "Nuances of a Theme" by Williams. Uh, in the face of that kind of criticism of Williams. And he quotes Williams' lines at the beginning of the poem. It's a strange courage you give me, ancient star. Shine alone in the sunrise, toward which you lend no part. And this is Stephen's commentary. His nuances is bringing forth the nuances of the theme by Williams. Shine alone, shine nakedly, shine like bronze that reflects neither my face nor any inner part of my being. Shine like fire that mirrors nothing. Lend no part to any humanity that suffuses you in its own light. Be not chimera of mourning, half man, half star. Be not an intelligence like a widow's bird or an old horse. And this is from a long poem called Notes Towards a Supreme Fiction. Um, you know, what is this supreme fiction? Stevens is frequently describing things in front of him, like the snowman, etc. But at the same time, he's aware that as he describes, the words become not literal, not exactly what's in front of him but a fiction, and that poetry moves towards what he calls a supreme fiction. <laughs> 
in this portion of his poem, Notes Towards a Supreme Fiction. It's called, It Must Give Pleasure. In the things that many teachers say about many poems, I think, you wouldn't know that pleasure was part of it. The poem becomes a kind of puzzle. One of the great things that happened in the 20th century was that the very same people who made famous people like James Joyce, uh, people like T.S. Eliot, Ezra Pound, and so many others, modernism, who made all of that famous, also made it sound as if it were a difficult thing to feel. One of the central books about poetry was called Understanding Poetry. It was not called Experiencing Poetry. It wasn't called Poetry as Ecstasy, Poetry as Deep Emotion. It was called Understanding Poetry. Poetry became something to be understood, not necessarily to be felt. Stevens didn't think that. But, as I say, the very same people who made some wonderful writers famous also made them out to be difficult. And so poetry becomes something that's difficult too. Notes towards a supreme fiction, it must give pleasure. To sing jubilers at exact accustomed times. To be crested and wear the mane of a multitude. And so as part to exult with its great throat. To speak of joy and to sing of it. Born on the shoulders of joyous men, to feel the heart that is common, the bravest fundament. This is a facile exercise. Jerome begat the tubas and the firewind strings, the golden fingers picking dark blue air. For companies of voices moving there to find of sound the bleakest ancestor, to find of light a music issuing whereon it falls in more than sensual mode. But the difficultest rigor is forthwith on the image of what we see to catch from that irrational moment, it's unreasoning. As when the sun comes rising, when the sea clears deeply, when the moon hangs on the wall of heaven haven. These are not things transformed, yet we are shaken by them as if they were. We reason about them with a later reason. What's up, family? This is Cap Brooks with Law and Disorder and the Anti-Police Terror Project, inviting you to join APTP for our 10th annual celebration of King's Radical Legacy. This year, we are proud to call KPFA an official partner. We'll kick off the week with a port action for Palestine on January 13th, followed that Saturday by our annual march on January 15th at 11 a.m. at Oscar Grant Plaza, located at 14th and Broadway in Oakland, California. Featured speakers this year include Linda Sarasor of Empower, Malkia Devitt Cyril, Nicole Lee, and many more. The march is wheelchair accessible and will be led by a disability contingent. Then hold on for a week of actions, trainings, and events to follow. For more information, go to antipoliceterrorproject.org. And keep listening to Law and Disorder weekdays at 8 a.m. right here on the People Station, KPFA.
Welcome to Cover to Cover, the Nina Serrano and Jack Foley Show, Part 2. I'm your host, Nina Serrano. I'm proud to say that my guest today is my husband of over 40 years, Paul Richards. Paul Richards has just published an exciting and inspiring book, Private Property and the Goddess. The first page of this exciting book offers a quote from the national poet of El Salvador, Roque Dalton, quote, quote, I accuse private property of depriving us of everything, unquote. You dedicate the book appropriately to your mother, Huddy Edwards. Tell us about her and your early life that led you to this theme of private property and the goddess. Well, thank you, Nina. It's a privilege and a pleasure to be here with you to talk about this book. I'm dedicating it to my mother because she's really, this book is the last conversation between us, out and out feminist, communist writer, journalist who suffered the exclusion from the mainstream and the persecution that communists have witnessed uh, in this country and abroad for decades and decades. That's the milieu in which I grew up. And from her writings and her outlook to life, I developed my worldviews that, that go into writing this book. And it also developed my desire to have a platform such as Estuary Press, where this book is published and where we publish your books and my father's films, Civil Rights Movement and the Peace Movements from the 1960s, on a platform that has no gatekeepers, that we put out and publish what we want, we say what we want. And that's been very important to uh, to us. And I have to dedicate this book to to my mother because she played such a big role in opening my eyes to what is in front of us here in this world today. Well, as a PhD in history, what led you to bring these two different words together? The subjects of private property and the goddess are two subjects not usually linked. How do they come together in your new book? My attempt in this book has been to try to understand why it is that the mainstream narrative cannot seem to understand the need to live in harmony with nature and cannot seem to stop the oppression of women on a global scale. And because I was raised outside this mainstream, I've been haunted, really, trying to understand why. what's the power that lays behind the continued false narrative that we live under. And so because I have a background as a Marxist and a scholar of, of U.S. history, I focused on private property and the role of private property in our lives. And I can begin to see that it's everywhere and everything. And what I didn't see and what this book helped me to see was the goddess. For, for me, the goddess is not a god outside of us up in the sky telling us what to do. The goddess is the life force that we all know exists. For me, is embodied in women in our societies, in the human society, with uh, the powers of creativity that lie within their bodies and the functions that this leads to in terms of their social roles and, and their roles in my life. Daughter, I have a mother, I have a sister, I have a wife, and all of these relationships have led me to understand the primary role of women and creativity, which opened me to understand this concept of the goddess. So how did you come to view Marxism as a patriarchal philosophy? Well, Marxism was so integral to my whole life. I, I didn't see it as that as I, as I joined the Marxist movements uh, in Berkeley in the 60s and during the uh, period when I was fighting the draft. I didn't see Marxism as a patriarchal philosophy until very, very recently. There's a section of the book which describes why I think that. One of the things that led me to look at it that way was my mother's view of Marx and Engels, which always included a critique of their treatment of their wives, their, li their wives in the times of the 19th century in Germany and England. And she was always adamant that they benefited from their wives' labor and from their input and they never acknowledged it. And I thought, hmm, well, you know, that's patriarchy for you. So I started to look at it that way. And when I started writing this book, I, I came to question of how the Marxist movement interacts with the goddess. And I began to 
look more deeply into it, I went back to Engels, the origins of family, private property in the state. I looked at Engels to try to see what his view of the family was. And I discovered that his view was that the family evolved with the evolution of human society through the stages of savagery, barbarism, and civilization. It was a lower to higher evolution. And for Engels, the family, the monogamous family, was the highest stage of the human family that civilization created, and it replaced what he called the promiscuous family of barbarism and the, well, there was another stage in savagery that he called it, but just the idea that that's the way the human family evolved struck me as wrong because I began to see that before history, in prehistory, it seems as if all human cultures were women-centered and that the goddess played a central role in all of those cultures. And you can see it from the amount of archaeological discoveries there are. So when I look at prehistory that's basically characterized as woman-centered and goddess-worshipping, that I see that what happened was not the evolution from lower to higher, but a actual radical change in which men seized the land and created an alternative culture to the ones that they were born into in order to reap the benefits of production for themselves and not have to share it with the mother's clan, which had dominated the social organization of prehistoric societies globally, that this happened as the evolution of human society continued and the ability to produce more and more in, in agriculture and in mining and other production activities created the possibility that you could sell these things to outside your immediate culture and reap profits to it. And this idea of grabbing the land and grabbing its production for your own benefit is at the heart of the establishment of patriarch. So from the very beginning, of civilization. Patriarchy was key to the creation of private property, and the evolution of women in that process was one of a fall from the center of culture to a slave to the man. And that was not lower to higher. That was defeat in a war and the results of conquest. And I couldn't put these things together. And so at the end of thinking about all of this, I had to conclude that Marxism was a patriarchal, a patriarchal philosophy because this notion that monogamy and the position of the women in a monogamous relationship is the highest stage of, of our cultural evolution is just wrong. It's it's not true. And it's working so badly in the worldwide war against women and the, the things that women suffer. That, that had to be the, the way I looked at it. What was the role of monogamy? What was it supposed to achieve? Well, monogamy arose out of the men's seizure of land because land was not owned in prehistory. This is a concept that's controversial many Many people don't want to admit that because they want to say that ownership it always existed, but doesn't really seem that that's true. What, what seems to be is that there was no ownership in the prehistoric period. And when you look at indigenous cultures around the world, they don't relate to ownership the way civilized societies relate to ownership. So when, when men seized the land, they had to find a way to keep the land in their hands, in the male hands, and not having it revert back to the female clan that they came from. I mean, this is the micro level of this whole, a lot of the spread of patriarchy had was done through conquest, like here in the United States, where a patriarchal European world wiped out the indigenous cultures that they found. So monogamy became the way in which the male ownership of land was secured to the children of that male and not allowed to revert back to the mother's clan where non-ownership was the standard. So monogamy became a part of land ownership and the male actually became the owner of the woman whose children then inherited from him and created a perpetual system of patriarchal land ownership. You couldn't have patriarchy without monogamy. What was the role of your father's suicide in the writing of this book? Well, I was a good Marxist for many years and I, I developed a deep deep defensiveness against the attacks against Marxism throughout my life and throughout the years that I fought the draft and that I sat in for civil rights, I went to jail. I was a member of the Communist Party. And I felt that the ta attacks against Marxism were so widespread that I had to defend it and that I, I developed a loyalty to it that was, that was very deep and built upon a lot of hurt. And so my father was this way. And he, he witnessed the demise of the Soviet Union as a very severe blow to his worldview. And in 2001, he committed suicide at the age of 89. I was 67. Well, I have a, a, a part in the book that I'd like to read about that, if I could. Please do. My father's suicide in April of 2001, when he was 89 and I was 67, removed the last barriers against thinking about where Marx and Engels went wrong 
I was not going to be an anti-Marxist because none of our problems came from Marxism. The adversarial nature of the U.S.'s anti-communist milieu had left me with scars of stubborn resistance that I could not shake until then. My father came to the end of the road after nine years of being partially paralyzed with a stroke and finally with a knee injury on his good knee that left him bedridden. Like a boxer softened up with a body attack, all that was left to finish him off was a right hook to the chin. That blow was the collapse of the Soviet Union and the seeming triumph of the capitalist imperialist system he had fought against his whole life. It was a terrible blow for him, and it left me wondering how to understand it. I knew that something basic in my father's world had been crushed, and that struck me as hard as anything else. The Marxism he had relied upon had let him down. My unquestioned allegiance to Marxism died with him. I could not ignore this failure. His suicide struck me deeply. And I began to say, okay, let's stop being mindlessly defensive here and let's look at this question. So it really opened me up to going back to the Engels, the origins of private property in the state. And so how did you recognize the goddess in your own life? Well, you know, I have a, another little section I'd like to read about that if I could. Yes. How, I wondered... Could the primacy of the goddess in prehistory stay hidden from me until now? The rise of feminist reinterpretations of our past had revealed it, potentially removing the blinders for all those ready to see. I had gone through two university history departments, earned my PhD, and yet never had occasion to confront this hidden fact. I had stuck to my rebellious roots for decades, joining the working class, working with my hands, and still remained blind. Now, seeing the female roots of civilization, I came to the realization that our society's blindness to nature and hostility to women are the same thing, tied together inextricably. My inability to transcend these roots placed me undeniably inside Russell Means' chorus, singing the same old song. I had to look more deeply into our female roots. How did the universal female goddess come to dominate prehistory? You have never mentioned this man before. Trying to find answers to the question of our blindness to the earth started for me with the American Indian leader Russell Means' 1980 speech, For America to Live, Europe Must Die. Russell Means, who lived from 1939 to 2012, was a leader of the American Indian movement during the occupation of Wounded Knee on the Sioux Reservation in 1973. He challenged European Americans generally, but pointedly include Marxists, to respect Mother Earth. He said that European Americans, including Marxists, had proved ourselves unable to hear him. I considered myself a Marxist for many decades, so his challenge hit home. I did not read Russell Means' 1980 speech until well into the new millennium. Things that had never interested me before became obsessions. I started reading in archaeology, genetics, prehistory, and Greek mythology. Years passed as I shifted from one subject to the next, trying to understand the general crisis of civilization that, that I have been living in my whole life. When my ideas began to crystallize, I realized that my understanding evolved in the context of my own personal history. And then I realized that I couldn't account for my society's blindness if I didn't understand my own blindness. So the first part of the book unfolds my history as a student, as a radical, as a carpenter, as a uh, jailbird in coming to grips with my own views of the world and how I was blind. How Russell, did you become a jailbird? Well, sitting in for civil rights in San Francisco, I spent a couple of months in the San Francisco County Jail and learned quite a bit about the nature of our justice system, and which revealed to me the true nature of our society. The Russell Means statement, for America to live, Europe must die, was very challenging, and especially because he included Marxists in that. He said for him to become a part of the workers' movement, according to Marxists, he would have to give up his language, give up his land, give up his culture. And he said he wasn't willing to do that, that that was an unreasonable demand. And I have to agree with him. And so I began to think outside the civilizational box that I had been in. I began to say, well, our connections to nature in civilization are very different from the connections of people to nature 
in these what I would call prehistorical or indigenous societies that Russell Means was advocating for. And this led me to understand the spiritual nature of the problems I was confronting. Because when you put everything down to the market and money, you destroy the spiritual nature of our connection to the earth. The value of a forest is only realized when you cut it down. That is putting everything on its head. We come from the forest. We come from, from the natural world. We can't destroy it to give it value. We have to find our way out of that. And Russell Means pointed me to this conclusion, and that is fundamental to the whole writing of the book. How did that lead you to the concept of the connection between private property and the goddess? The prehistoric world existed without ownership of land. And all of my studies of prehistoric cultures from American indigenous tribes to other prehistoric societies that I've studied indicate that they had a deep spiritual connection. They saw the trees, the rocks, the rivers as living things that you need to respect and live in harmony with. When I was in high school, I was a student of Joe Brown, who wrote a book called The Seven Sacred Rites of the Oglala Sioux. And he was in charge of religious studies at this school, which was in Sedona, Arizona, a very beautiful place to spend three years of my young life. And he would bring the elders from the Hopi, the Navajo, and the Zuni tribes to speak to the student body. And they brought a concept of the oneness of life that I had never heard before, coming from a radical family, growing up in an interracial leftist communist family in Oakland, California. I had never heard that we should live in harmony with nature. I came from a milieu which finally led me to ask at one point, do we really need nature? That question was a real question. I looked around and I thought, well, do we really need it? Can't we just destroy everything? And <laughs> it's such a ridiculous question, but it's certainly one that everyone has got to come to grips with, especially when you live in concrete cities and all the real ways we survive are come from socially derived electrical systems, plumbing systems, the water, the sewer, the everything is delivered to us. And is, is nature really needed? Can't we just do this without nature? You know, I mean, just anyway. Of course we need nature, we're part of nature. And my exposure to these holy men in high school opened my eyes to it. But then it was like, I closed my eyes to it there for many years afterwards and went into, you know, the universities, the political movements that struggle to make a living. And it was like a separate compartment and it didn't pop back out of my life, out into my view until I was much older, as a matter of fact, and as I started to contemplate this book to try to understand because of being excluded from the dialogues of our society as a as a communist and a marxist for all those years i felt the need to just put this down as i as i as i saw it and a good section of the book is do devoted to trying to assess how the goddess became central to prehistoric times how do you feel that happened you take us through an exploration of the takedown of the goddess culture from the Greek myths to the Old Testament Bible. Tell us about the role of the Greek myths. Well, I became aware of the Greek myths because of my determination to try to understand why the mainstream narrative would not budge. I had to go back to the origins of Western mythology, things that work deeply in our society, that work through our school system, through the books we read, through the assumptions in everybody's lives. And so I came to Greek philosophy wondering, you know, here's philosophy that was set down 2,000 years, 2,500 years before the Bible was written. And these people were much closer to the battle against the goddess in the prehistoric world. And so I was looking in the in the Greek myths, where which I read through the writings of Hesiod, to try to see what they thought and how their how their origin myth related to the pre-existing goddess. So let me read this one section about that. Let's see. My new understanding of the end of prehistory made me wonder about Greek mythology. How did the ancient philosophers of patriarchy see the origins of their way of life? Maybe I could see the outlines of the demise of the goddess somewhere in their writings. After all, these writers were thousands of years closer to the times when the goddess was universally respected than we are today. I began to dig into the myths like in archaeologists in a graveyard. I came to the whole myth of Aphrodite. 
the figure in Greek mythology epitomized the role of women. And I asked myself, how is this different from the goddess? So as an example of how these Greek myths gave me insight into the suppression of the female goddess cultures that, that preceded them, I looked at the story of Aphrodite. In the book, I write the following. As beautiful and desirable as she was, the emergence of Aphrodite was a major demotion for women. Women fell from universal goddess, worshipped as the source of all life, to the one-dimensional sex slave who, quote, loves the organs of sex. She emerged from the earthly white foam bubbling up around the castrated genitals of Uranus, not from the female wound, but from the imagination of a man. Aphrodite, says the myths, owes her existence to Uranus' godly genitals, which occasioned her epiphany in the world. It is easy to imagine this notion originating in the plight of the first men to seize the land. He's rebelled against the goddess culture and laid a claim to the land for himself alone. He's having a hard time finding a wife who will give him some male children to leave the property to when the time comes. Ancient custom had placed the control of children in women's hands. They believed that children came from the spirits and the ancestors, not from the father. So imagine this man outside the confines of cultures that had raised him needing a wife. He couldn't just barge into a circle of women, point to one and say, okay, you come with me. I will take charge of the children that we create. The woman might laugh. Oh, really? You will raise the kids? Ha! The man replies, no, my dear, you will do it, but I will rule over you. The whole clan centered around the woman would not go for it at all. They would throw him out and slam the door. His only alternative would be to use force to grab her and lock her up in his little farmhouse. But if he raided the village and grabbed her, she could run off back to the village the first time he turned his back. So feeling alone and rejected, laying there in his farmhouse, he imagines the ideal woman. He needs her for sex and procreation. So the ideal would be a woman who loves the organs of sex. She would be beautiful and young and charming, and she would believe in him and his power over the land and he would call her Aphrodite. So looking through these myths was one tale after another of this demotion of the status of women wrapped up in these pretty packages like Aphrodite was, but nevertheless, the content of these myths was a huge demotion for women who are reliving and suffering this demotion in every generation that I... Then, of course, I came to the Bible. And here, let me read one more little... Please do. This is about both the Bible and the Greek myths. Start off with the concept of the abyss. God created everything out of nothing. This concept is the essence of the suppression of the goddess, because it's an assumption that says that before the male god in the sky created life, there was nothing. Well, before a male god in the sky existed, there was the woman-centered cultures of prehistory. The concept of the abyss was part of the war against the goddess. Is it any different than our modern propaganda, I wondered? How could we understand the war in Vietnam, for instance, if we think of the Vietnamese as gooks? Such concepts reduce real humans to unworthy enemies instead of people who are fighting for their independence and freedom. For the Greeks, the abyss erases the universal goddess who is being obliterated through land seizures. Conquerors reduce their victims to inhuman status, reserved for enemies everywhere. The lasting impact of this process is visible in the widespread ignorance and contempt of the so-called primitive people that permeates modern civilization. What is the timeline of all of these events? You know, I put a timeline in the book because it was I was curious to answer that question. Just looking at the, the big picture, I, I began to see that you could time this in the following way. You could say that the rise of private property happened between 12,000 and 8,000 BC. Over those 4,000 years, male usurpation of the land seems to have taken place. The first patriarchal civilizations arose in 8,000 BC in the Mesopotamian Valley in Iraq. The Greek myths arose in 3,000 BC. So that's after 5,000 years of patriarchal civilizations had existed. But they existed as little pockets, and they came and they went. There were a lot of them that rose and fell. But each time one arose, the pattern was set. The Bible appeared in 500 BC. So the Bible is like 2,500 years after the Greek myths existed. And the Greek myths 
were not the only set of myths that were out there, but it's the one that we in the West cite and base so much of our views of the world on. So I, I, I focused on them. So if for the last 8,000 years, did you say, we have been under patriarchy, what, what hope is there for women? What can we do about this situation? Well, let me read what I wrote in the, fi- in the conclusion of my book. If the roots of our global rush to disaster are in patriarchy and private property, what does humanity now 8 billion strong do to turn this around? I have my answers to this question, and so do many others who have thought about it. Whatever happens, it is clearly necessary for us to heed the call of Russell Means and others to to respect nature and the earth. Human societies must take off the patriarchal blinders and recognize the fundamental rights of women and the earth to exist in a healthy condition. At a minimum, this means reforming the laws on private property to include the rights of rivers to be clean, other life forms to live free of poisons and extinction, of the air to be clean and breathable. The right of women to control their own bodies, including the right to abortion, is the bottom line in the fight to reform patriarchy. The expansion of society's safety networks to include child care, free education, and to put an end to homelessness gives expression to the social compact that must replace the individualism that has led us down the wrong path. We cannot pull these elements apart and solve them piece at a time. They're all related, and the success of any part depends on the advancement of the whole. Well, how can interested listeners read your book, Private Property and the Goddess? and learn more about your works, both in print and video? Well, you can go to uh, suapress.com, E-S-T-U-A-R-Y-P-R-E-S-S, no space, no caps, dot com. And there's a, a header on that landing page that you can click on, and that'll take you to on Amazon, on Barnes & Noble. on It's available as an ebook and as a uh, paper book, uh, paperback book. On, um, so listeners can find the book through estuarypress.com. Yes, or they can search directly on Amazon for Private Property and the Goddess by well, Paul thank, Richards. Yeah. Yes, thank you so much, Paul Richards, author of Private Property and the Goddess. You're welcome, and thank you for having me on here. It's a pleasure. of our incredible listeners make what we call here at KPFA major donations. What's a major donation? Any donation that's $1,000 or more. Thank you so much for that. If you're thinking about making a $500, $700, or $800 donation, consider bumping it up a bit so that it qualifies as a major donation. My name is Italina, Donor Relations Manager, thanking you for your support of the station. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA Berkeley, 89.3 KPFB Berkeley, and 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR Santa Cruz, 94.3 K232FC in Monterey, and always online at kpfa.org. 